Hello, um, I'm sort of mostly naked, no slides, but I've got a theremin hidden somewhere in the room. <laughs> and it's making sound effects to accompany me. I'm a runner and co-director of Coney. Beautiful. And um, Coney um, is an agency that makes play, basically anything that people can play in some shape or form. And it's all about the kind of the experience of the playing audience. Okay. <laughs> Starting to learn the rules of the space a little bit. Let's just, just, I'm going to make a prediction. Oh, no. I thought it was this line. Anyway, the, um, and there's, a kind of, there's a practical philosophy kind of, kind of guiding Coney's kind of uh, play. Um, with three kind of key principles. Principle of adventure. Everything should feel as exciting as adventure. Principle of loveliness, which is a deep one. I'll just leave it at that. And principle of curiosity, which kind of is as it says on the tin. Um, we often make things that use technology. I mean, like, in the theatre world, which is kind of where I often live, um, we're sort of hailed as kind of, kind of great for using technology, but that technology is often quite straightforward. It's, kind of, it's mostly digital communications, uh, email, SMS, etc. And um, I'm going to talk... I've got a sort of very loose sort of like theme, but very, maybe kind of slightly epic theme, I'm kind of going for the Andy Field Prize for the most hyperbole um, that one can use as an in-joke for the theatre crowd. I apologise if you're not part of that. Um, the, um, it's about sort of like looking at like the kind of relationship between art, technology and people, which fundamentally is kind of what all of this is about. Uh, We're in a lecture theatre, you cannot get away from that function that it normally has. You cannot get away from the place where we are, the history that kind of might kind of go there. These are all presents, however much they, kind of might, they, might be, they, they, are, they might be actually being used in the, kind of the work itself. And any space kind of has got these kind of, these kind of properties. And um, maybe, and technology um, as a play space also has those as well. And one can investigate these properties. Um, as a kind of, I mean, we, Coney kind of sometimes plays like a secret agency. I, um, I ran recently uh, a training program for Playful Secret Agents, which is kind of like kind of Coney 101. Um, and one of the kind of bits of process there is kind of what we call reconnaissance. Um, and that's kind of like you know, looking at what is possible in a space, looking for the affordances, uh, which are kind of like the interactive properties of a space, the actions that you can do with it. Uh, not necessarily those that it's designed for, um, and then the opportunities those affordances give you to make play. Um, we might think about the art um, as being kind of providing the kind of, some kind of dream, some kind of vision of where things might go, and kind of how that might uncover new possibilities. But it's also really important to understand about the people and. If you're making a play space, this is a space where people are going to play and participate. And these kind of, the kind of spectrum, of, well, the, the different levels, like starting from just getting people's attention to getting their engagement, to getting their participation. And maybe there's an assumption that, that you know, you make the space, if you build it, they will come. That's also bollocks, unfortunately. You need to um, understand what motivates and inspires people to... Um, to participate. And I think that um, having done some participate if a space kind of gives them those, uh, yeah, at the chance. It's about half my time. I'm going to whiz very quickly through three 
things, uh, very three specific things. The first of which wasn't a Kony piece, um, it's a game for the iPhone called Papa Sangre um, uh, that was made by something else and I was one of a team of people um, that made this and it's a game, um, it's a game that was kind of came from a seed um, of an old theatre game that um, I used to play um, and uh, where it's kind, of, it's kind of a murder in the dark game where people are moving in pitch darkness trying to avoid something that's trying to kill them or eat them. And the iPhone game kind of is exactly that. You are in the kingdom of Papa Sangre, the land of the dead, and uh, following a trail to try to rescue the soul of somebody dear to you, but you're, you're basically in a dark room, because um, the, the, the point about this game is that there are no, there's, there's no pictures in it, except the pictures that are in your head. It's all done through sound. You wear headphones and you're immersed into this world. Um, and very importantly, in terms of the process of making this, it was originally a commission from 4AP um, to make a game for the iPhone that uh, visually impaired players could play as well as sighted players. That we had a little bit of a vision and a manifesto um, that we wrote about what we wanted this to be, what was going to be important about this game, kind of laying that down because here the technology, the play space, did not exist yet. We had to kind of invent that. Um, and it's, sort of, it's a badly kept secret that for the first year of the game's development, um, we couldn't make it work. Um, and we're gradually, as kind of technology, kind of, kind of, uh, technology kind of kept up, um, and t t the, the, the Apple's that operating system increased, and we managed to, kind of, like, to find basically a little bit of a switch which then enabled the binaural sound, because you hear the sounds kind of around you, kind of as they are, enable that to suddenly kind of kick in and suddenly the game was working. But it was only because we had that manifesto for the full year that kind of kept us going and aiming towards that point where then this new technology, this new play space could be created. And what now exists is a platform, an engine, whereby any space can be made in sound. We can drop sounds in um, and lay kind of a game engine on top of that. Um, and, you know, whole new kind of possibilities now uh, being explored. Um, there's a... They talk about two bits of Coney's practice. Um, there's work that we do in classrooms, in formal education settings, um, that we kind of call under the loose kind of like sort of domain name Adventures in... Um, and one that we made originally back to the art centre um, called Cat Escapes. And I, I, it's pretty easy, I'll just tell you quickly the story of the Cat Escapes. Um, and this was a class of kids who'd read a book called Varjak Poor by S.S. Saeed. Um, in this book, Varjak Poor is a little bit like the Karate Kitten. Um, he's a pampered cat who learned an ancient feline martial art called the way in order to survive in a very grim world. The kids are obsessed with the book. Um, they get a parcel from Varjak addressed to them. Um, and um, he's asking for their help. Inside is a letter, a very badly typed letter, because cats can type, we all know this of course. Um, every time they run across a keyboard, that's what they're trying to do. They just get their paws stuck quite often. Um, and um, he's asking for their help because his cousin, Jasmine, who's a minor character in one of the books, um, has been catnapped. She's vanished, and he wants to find her. And all he has is what turns out to be an email address. The kids email, and Jasmine responds. She's been catnapped by enthusiastic Egyptologists who are going to take her to Egypt in six weeks, which happens to be the end of term, um, unless the kids, this classroom of kids, can help her. And basically what unfolds, and this kind of what kind of characterizes adventures in learning, is um, res it's responsive storytelling in episodes where there is, um, there's, a there's a story, episodes of that story delivered into the event of the classroom, which is story time, and challenges then being presented to the class. So the first, in the first week, um, the challenge is she's trying to reach this little window in the room where she's being, she's being, she's being held captive. Um, it's too high for her to reach, but it might be the way out. All there is in this room are newspapers, drinking straws, and a random roll of sellotape. 
And so what the kids then work out, and they spend all day doing this, um, is that they can build like a flimsy tower out of these materials, which can then help the, like, the small cats um, reach this window. So they spend all day doing this, then they email through to her their instructions and diagrams of how to do this, which then helps the next, um, which helps to get to the window and means the next episode happens. And um, this happens then to cover design, technology, a little bit of math. So the, the whole curriculum over the course of this six-week adventure is, um, is, basically, is basically tackled for the class in a way that they're completely motivated to tackle because of the agency that they have in doing this. And this is what, I mean, this is, this is basically just using email. Um, but the important properties of this is not to do so much with the email. It's kind of platform agnostic in a way. It's more that the qualities of it being responsive storytelling, it's not a game. Whatever they do will happen to be just enough to help her kind of get through, and the story will adjust accordingly. Um, and the remote agency of it, so it's not a character that is in their classroom. It gives space to the teacher and to them to kind of get on, it gives them more agency as a result. And also, it kind of gives more power to their imagination, because like far better to imagine uh, a typing cat than to perhaps to see a talking cat. Um, final thing, how am I doing for time, anybody? Seven minutes. Oh, wow. Much more. I might finish sooner. Um, Coney itself, um, as an organisation, is kind of quite a peculiar beast. Um, there is an agency, um, a kind of little professional agency, which is like the engine room, um, and uh, with kind of a small crew of about seven of us based in London mostly. Um, but it also, um, it, it, it playfully, we say that it plays like a game of secret society. It's a big open network where we take code names and um, where anybody can join this network, anybody can find the way in. And we've recruited people that we've worked with, but also from the, you know, people in our audiences, people who play well, end up getting invited in as well. And um, there's, a, there's a space, I mean, called the garden um, that exists online and that kind of is analogue um, uh, in the world is we have these events called play days, which are essentially just kind of gatherings of the society to kind of come together in kind of quite an open space kind of a way to make play and to make things through play. Um, and it's, um, it's something that I think we got wrong um, before we got right. And in as much as within sort of this new kind of connected age, everybody is talking about how to kind of make communities how to make these kind of spaces where people kind of come together around something. I think that it's important to understand that what is fundamentally driving people's participation and engagement are things that, that are themselves kind of, they're not, not, not very much to do with the technology. They're far more to do with the kind of like what it's all about and the kind of space that's kind of opened up and the kind of relationships and the terms of those relationships between um, the... Um, the, the people who are participating, and I think that's at its core. And I think where we got it wrong was trying to kind of control this space sort of too much, um, like not kind of deliberately, not kind of through bad intentions. It was kind of inadvertent, kind of the way, how much harder for people to, kind of, to come into it. And also, in, we tried to sort of be kind of too top down in the way that we were kind of, I think we were kind of trying to kind of engage people in society. Um, we tried gamifying it, if that... Um, so it means anything to you. It's rubbish. Gamification is also bollocks. I've, like, I've, I've said bollocks, that's the third time now. So um, <laughs> I've said bollocks to gamification, uh, Peter Brook, and um, something else. I can't remember what the other one was. But either way, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, and um, what I sort of kind of have been finding, rather, is that by making this really kind of an open space where Coney is not so much controlling the space, but is a host of the space, not necessarily the only host. We kind of happen to be at the moment, but other hosts could kind of come into this. And where then the individual agencies of like the artists who are, in, like, who are playing in this space are not going to be subsumed. It's going to be trying to find the ways for Coney to still its, its agency to, to be preserved, but also that of the artists and how that, how that is kind of balanced. And I was in Melbourne um, uh, recently. And uh, one of the things I did there was to run a uh, version of this um, 
Playful Secret Agent training program, um, which had another agenda. There was another objective, which I won't go into now. Um, but um, what inadvertently happened was that a lot of people took part, um, and four out of them are now code names within the society and a kind of a much more kind of active um, hub than um, in other kind of in other places. I mean, Coney's network, this, 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 this society is kind of spread out all over the world. Um, and it feels like that what happened through the training program was kind of blindingly obvious that uh, people were, were, particip were participating in this. They had a shared experience together. And they, this was around like a shared set of values in a way. And they, kind of, they were excited by the, kind of the whole thing of being a secret agent and, kind of like, and how that actually plays out on this. We're doing stuff out on the streets as well in that kind of ballpark. Um, but also, I mean, there was, this was centered around the principle of loveliness, and that kind of gives kind of a little bit of a vision that, kind of, that everybody kind of got excited and could kind of cluster around. And it's something they were doing together. They were doing that together in person. And then how that, um, yeah, these old fashioned, in a way, like sort of kind of experiences and, like kind of, and the kind of what's kind of at the root of those, then taking that into an online space. And the online space continues to glue together um, these kind of these connections and continues to glue together also between you know, London and Melbourne. And there's kind of a lot of wonderful inter interplay going on between those, those two particular hubs. But it's because, but the, but the technology here then becomes, and this, this online play space becomes the facilitator to keep things going. But what started things out is rather an experience that was kind of, that was had together. And, um, and one where I think you know, the, the, those principles, those dimensions of agency related and competence that I flagged up to do with resilience at the start, that the more we can make a space where those can flourish for individuals as well as the various agencies involved, the better. And I'm struck, I mean, and this is completely accidental, how um, the, those kind of principles of Coney that have been discovered through practice kind of before, before that, adventure, loveliness, and curiosity, are almost like a sort of kind of an, an exciting version of agency-related incompetence. Um, and perhaps in as much as they've, they've, those principles have proven a really strong practical guide for, like, for making good interactive play, then perhaps there's kind of, that's kind of no mistake. I think, time check, I think I'm going to finish a minute early. Thanks very much for your attention.